So let's go ahead and stand, and let's start with To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Hath Done. We'll sing all three of these verses on the first. <laughs> to God be the glory, great things He hath done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement. Sin and open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he has done. Oh, perfect redemption, a purchase of blood. To every believer, the promise of God. A vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. And on the last, great things he hath taught us. Great things he hath done. And great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our worship when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he had done. Amen. This is why we're put on the earth to glorify him. Whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we should do all to his glory. And I hope that everything this morning in our service and in your heart is to glorify and lift up the Lord. Let's right. sing Blessed Assurance. We'll sing all three of these verses today. Amen. 
are we praising him all the day long, right? Sometimes we, uh, oh, I slipped it in where I praise him. And a lot of the days we're complaining and arguing and fighting and so forth. But because of the assurance of our salvation, if that's all that you had from him, we have so much more. But if that's all you had, that should be enough for us to praise him all day long. Let's sing one more song on the backside. Glorify thy name. And we'll sing all three of these verses together. Father, we love you. Father, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name, all the earth. Glorify thy name. that's going to happen, if his name is going to be glorified in all the earth, it's going to take us, his people, to spread it uh, for other people to hear that otherwise wouldn't hear. And uh, so hopefully that is our goal. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Wonderful singing. And at this time, the choir is going to come and sing for us.
Amen. It's wonderful to have uh, a shepherd that is the good shepherd. All that shepherds do, Jesus does for us and more. We have things going on right now in our church with people in uncertain places. Good to know that we're, we're in the shepherd's hands. I was talking to Bob this morning that uh, Kelly, she's, she's not in good hands, that's all state, but she's in the best hands with the Lord. So we praise the Lord that he is our shepherd. And uh, thank you, Isabel, for playing you know, uh, beautiful in that song. All right, let's pick our Bibles to Zechariah chapter 12. We're going to open in prayer in just a moment. We're continuing our series through the book of Zechariah, working through verse by verse, and looking forward to getting into God's Word this morning. Let's pray and ask for God to meet with us and for us to listen, whatever He has to say. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for all that we have in You. We thank You that there is no problem that we can face, that You are not already there. You know how it will turn out. You have all the power and the tools to bring us through that, and I pray that you'd help us to rest in you, help us to learn what it means to rest in you, to, to have peace in the midst of a storm. I pray that as we open your word this morning, that you would lift our hearts to heaven, help us to meet with you in a special way, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Zechariah chapter 12, throughout Israel's history, there have been many ups and downs. That is, to put it mildly, I mean, any people, obviously, but Israel's history is a particular roller coaster ride. I mean, there are ups and downs, and it seems like as soon as they're up, they're down again, and then they're up again. And there, there have been many instances of God's judgment. There have been many instances, and we'll talk about some of them. We won't maybe turn to a lot of different places this morning, but many instances of, of Israel, because they've been away from God, God bringing judgment on them. And then there have also been many instances of God's deliverance for Israel. And then sometimes as a result of the judgment, sometimes as a result of the deliverance, there have been many times that Israel has turned back to God, that they have repented. By the way, not every time that they were judged and then God brought them back from the judgment, not every time did they turn back to him. The Babylonian captivity is one example. That God didn't bring them back from Babylon because they had turned back to him. He just brought them back because he had set the, the egg timer for 70 years and it dinged, you know, 70 years are up, time to come back. They were still far from God. But there, there were many times that Israel repented of their sin. They turned back to God and they were able to have God's blessing again. What we see in Zechariah 12 is, I believe, all three in, in the same passage, we see Israel's greatest judgment as well as Israel's greatest deliverance ever, followed by their greatest repentance ever that we've ever seen in their history. We're going to see all of it in one chapter. It'll play out in the future. This is yet to come. So Zechariah 12, I simply entitled our message today, Israel's Greatest Repentance. Uh, I just called it that because it was too long of a title to call it Israel's Greatest you know, all three, Israel's greatest judgment and deliverance and repentance. But we're going to see all, all of this. So let's jump in, Zechariah 12, verse 1 says this. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. We see the word burden here. We saw it a few chapters ago. And remember, the, the word burden typically in the, in the prophets means something that is very weighty and heavy to be carried, and it's usually a judgment of some kind. And so this is, uh, God is for Israel, but it says this is the burden of God for Israel, the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel. This is going to be a judgment that is going to be laid on them, and we don't see a lot in this chapter about that judgment. We'll, we see it in other places. But before it gets to that judgment, it says that this is coming from God, which, by the way, he gives some of his, uh, his resume here, some of his credentials, which stretcheth forth the heavens, layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. This is something that God did way back in the beginning. People often observe the creation. They observe the universe and say, oh, it looks like maybe the universe is expanding. So what does that mean? There must have been a big bang at some point. 
It must have all been in a central location, and then it exploded, and now it's drifting outward. By the way, scientifically, it doesn't ex that doesn't explain the way things are because there are some, you know, as far as the laws of physics, there are some galaxies that, as there, if there were an explosion, that they all went out like that. Some galaxies are spinning this direction, and some are spinning that direction. And that doesn't happen from a natural, out in space, there is no wind and so forth. So the, if you send something in motion, it's just going to keep going like that. And so if there's an explosion, things would all spin the same direction. And, and a lot of things don't line up with the Big Bang. But here's one thing. I will say that the universe may be expanding. And the reason it is expanding is because God made it expand when he created it. It says that he, and there are a couple of times that this phrase is used in the Bible, that God stretcheth forth the heavens. And maybe that idea that, that when he set everything in motion, that he did set planets and galaxies in a way that they were kind of drifting and, and expanding. Uh, beyond that, it's above my pay grade. But anyway, God says in his word that he stretcheth forth the heavens and he laid the foundation of the earth. Everything that we are on, it was put here by God. There was a time that it wasn't, and then there was a time that God did it. And then he gets, not just the universe and the earth, and then he gets very specific. And that he formed the spirit of man within him. That God is responsible for you and me, all of us. We would not be here were it not for God. He started it, he made the dust, and then he took the dust and he formed Adam and Eve, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so God is the one. If God did all of that, God started things from the beginning, and, and so it shows his sovereignty. He's able to do anything, and he's able to give this burden that is coming. He's able to, to foretell what is going to happen. God's the only one that can foretell. We talked about this earlier, I think, in, in Zechariah. There are people who claim certain things, you know, a clairvoyant and a medium and so forth, witches and fortune tellers and soothsayers, and, oh, I'm going to go get my palm read, uh, that's a waste of time and money and everything because they have no idea what they're talking about. Those people, when they're done, when you walk out, they go and they go to their own fortune teller. <laughs> tell me what I can tell the next people. They don't know. It's, only God knows the future. And so God is telling in this chapter what is going to happen. It is a burden of judgment, first of all, that he lays on Israel, which we will call Israel's greatest judgment. And there have been many great judgments that Israel has gone through in their history. Two of the greatest are the Babylonian captivity. And by the way, these two are, are ones that where Jerusalem itself was destroyed and the temple was destroyed. But there have been many, many other... Uh, so 586 BC, the Babylonian captivity when Nebuchadnezzar came in, destroyed Jerusalem and took away many captives. 70 AD, when the Romans came in and did the same thing, took away some captives, destroyed, uh, actually they, they mostly laid siege and, and killed as many as they could. They also destroyed the temple. Jesus prophesied when he was on the earth, he said there's not going to be one stone left upon another here. And they came in and decimated the temple and, and the walls in Jerusalem and all of this. Uh, so there have been many judgments on Israel. This one is going to be the greatest. What about it? And by the way, there have been other things after uh, things that are recorded in scripture. There was famously the Holocaust of World War II when upwards of six million Jews were put to death by Hitler and the Germans and, and others. And even greater than that, and we don't know exactly the number of people that will be killed in this siege that's going to be mentioned in this chapter, but it's going to be a great number of Jews worldwide and in Israel that will be attacked and killed. And this will be Israel's greatest judgment Look at verse 2, what it says. It says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. So there's going to be a siege here where people are going to come from far with their armies and they're going to try to attack and destroy the Jews, Israel, the people, and again, this is going to be an even greater siege than happened in AD 70. In all of the previous times, there have been other times when people have tried to wipe out the Jews. 
One thing we know from the Bible is that no one will ever wipe out the Jews. It's one of God's promises. It goes back to the Abrahamic covenant. It's reiterated in Jeremiah 33 and other places. They will never be wiped out. It doesn't mean that God is always happy with them. In fact, what we're looking at here is the burden of the Lord for Israel. He's not happy with them because of their sin. But no one will ever wipe them out. But so many times in history when someone has tried to wipe them out, be it Haman in the Persian Empire, when Haman tried to kill Esther and Mordecai and all of the Jews. Whenever there has been an attempt before, it has usually been by one group of people or one leader. But this siege is going to be a worldwide siege. It says it's going to be nations. It's going to be many nations. In fact, the Bible uses the phrase all nations. Now, I don't know if it's necessarily going to be every single nation on the earth, but every nation of power, they're, they're going to turn against Israel here, and they're going to march on Israel, and they're going to try to destroy Israel. And I want to look at some places. And so this, when this happens, this is what is going to be often called the day of the Lord in the prophets of the Old Testament. The day of the Lord. It's going to be in the tribulation period. It's going to be that seven-year period the main world leader will be the Antichrist, and there will be other nations. You have to kind of, you can piece together some things from different scriptures in the Old Testament. And so let's look at what this day of the Lord is. The tribulation period is going to be awful for the whole world, and specifically it's going to be awful for Israel until the end of it. So look at, let's look at some places. Jeremiah chapter 30. I want to look at Jeremiah and Daniel and Matthew and then Zechariah 14. So look at Jeremiah 30 and verse 7. I want to draw out of here how the day of the Lord and how this judgment is going to be unlike anything that Israel's ever faced. So Jeremiah 30 and verse 7. It says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble but he shall be saved out of it. So Jacob, meaning the nation of Israel here, this the tribulation period, the day of the Lord, is going to be horrible for them. It's going to be the time of their trouble, but then at the end of it, they will be delivered, uh, they'll be saved out of it. Look at Daniel chapter 11. And so here we see, um, there's several places. Daniel 7 talks about the Antichrist. Daniel 11 talks about the Antichrist and the tribulation period, some things that go on. I want to mention a couple of the things that are happening to, to show that this is the Antichrist and then what it says in, into chapter 12. So Daniel 11 verse 31 says this, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. We won't turn there right now, but Daniel 9, 24 through 27 explains that this is the prince that shall come, the Antichrist. He's going to make a seven-year peace treaty with Israel, and in the middle of that, he's going to break the peace treaty. He's going to go, and the Bible calls it, he's going to uh, sacrifice, he's going to cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. There's going to be a temple during, it's not there right now, but during the tribulation period, there will be a temple with sacrifices that Israel will be sacrificing to God in, Judy, in uh, Judaism and so forth. That's going to be sanctioned by the Antichrist. He's going to allow that for the first half of the tribulation, and then he's going to stop it. He's going to go into the temple himself and sit on a throne and demand to be worshipped as God. And that's going to be called the abomination that make it desolate. And when he does that, we'll see that in Matthew 24 in just a minute, but... So he's going to do that. He's going to place the abomination that maketh desolate. Look at verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. Namely, he's going to say that he is God. By the way, the, the term, the name Antichrist is against Christ. But the phrase anti in Greek also means instead of. So he's going to put himself instead of Christ. He's going to say, I'm Christ. He's going to say, I'm God. He's going to demand to be worshipped. And so there he's going to, several times it says this about him in different places, that he's going to speak lofty things. Things that are going to come out of his mouth that ought to never come out of anybody's mouth. 
you know, blasphemous things against God and saying that he's God. So he's going to magnify himself above every God and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. So he's going to be the main one bringing horrible things against the nation of Israel. Peace for the first half of the tribulation, but then he's going to turn on them. And when he declares that he's God, he's going to turn against Israel and fight against them and try to wipe them out. And Jesus, we'll come back to what Jesus says. Look at Daniel 12 and verse 1. So this is all at the same time. It says, and at that time, this, this prophecy of Daniel is all given together. There's a break, but chapter 12 is just a continuation of chapter 11. And at that time shall Michael stand up. This is Michael the archangel. The great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. And so these, we'll, we're kind of getting into our second point here, but uh, back to back, there'd be the greatest judgment time. There's never been a time like this time of trouble, and then they will be delivered out of it. And so look at Matthew 24 and verse 15. Jesus reiterates that the Antichrist is coming. The, the question they ask him is, what's going to be the sign of the end of the world and of your coming? And he, in Matthew 24 and 25, he talks about things that will happen in the end times. And he says that the Antichrist is going to come and he's going to do something, this abomination of desolation. And when that happens, he says, it's immediately on. You are to escape as fast as you can. So let's read. We won't read all of it, but look at Matthew 24, starting in verse 15. It says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. So that's what we just read, as well as Dan it's twice in Daniel 9, Daniel 9 and then Daniel 11 that we read. When you read, when you see what was spoken by Daniel, Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then, verse 16, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And he goes on to say, you flee immediately. If you hear about it, you see it, you don't even go back home. If you're in the field, you don't even go back home to grab your stuff. You just leave. Because there will be a coordinated attack, I believe, that will be premeditated and timed that the Antichrist, I believe, and his forces will say, we're going to go to the temple, and, and as soon as we do this, I want you to attack all Israel at the same time. I believe that will be coordinating. So Jesus says, when it happens, you immediately flee. And it goes on to say, Woe to be that with child, that are with child, them that give suck in those days. Pray that, pray that your flight be not in the winter, because it's going to be hard to travel, and it's going to be a lightning attack from the Antichrist. So look down in verse 21, and it says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. The reference there to the elect, I believe, is talking about Israel as the elect people of God. And so he says, if God didn't, and, it, and it's already, we know that it's going to be shortened. We know that the time is going to be a seven-year, the second half, a three-and-a-half-year great tribulation. God's already set the time that he's going to come back and deliver them. But if he didn't, if God just let it go on, it says no flesh would be saved. They would wipe out all of the Jews. But for the elect's sake, God will shorten those days and, uh, and will save them. So this is going to be a great, and one more passage that talks about it. We won't to get too far ahead of ourselves, but look at Zechariah 14. Verses 1 through 3, and again, it comes back and, and mentions a couple more things about this moment, about this attack. Zechariah 14, verse 1. And here we see the scale of the attack on Israel. It's, it's the Antichrist leading it, but it's everyone against Israel. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city 
shall be taken. So when it says that, we're going to talk about the deliverance just a minute. When it says that they'll be delivered, it doesn't mean that they're going to be delivered with no casualties. It says when they attack, the city will be taken. They will attack, they will destroy the city, they will, they will kill many that are in the city. Jesus says, flee. Whoever doesn't flee will be killed. Whoever doesn't make it out. It says, for I will, uh, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And so here's kind of a description in different places, piecing it together. This will be the greatest tribulation, the greatest judgment, and it's from God. God is the one gathering and bringing the nations to attack them. So if God loves them so much, why would he do this? We're going to get to that, why he's doing it. But it's because of their sin. It's also because he loves them. But God is the one who gathered Nebuchadnezzar. He says, he's my servant. I'm going to bring him and, and send him against Israel. And then after seven years, I will deliver them. But God is the one bringing this judgment. It's the Antichrist. He, he hates Israel, and, but he's following what God is allowing. He's going to try to wipe them out. God will not allow them to be totally wiped out. But many of them will be killed. This will be the greatest judgment that Israel's ever faced. That all the nations and armies of the world will gather. It says they're going to go to this valley in Megiddo. And by the time Jesus is done with them, it says that the blood will be as deep as the horse's bridle. There's going to be massive army bloodshed uh, by Jesus to them. Uh, but that's a snapshot of the, um, of the judgment, the, the siege against Israel, specifically in Jerusalem. And let's go on in Zechariah 12, look at verse 3, and let's talk about Israel's greatest deliverance. It will come right on the heels of their greatest judgment. And we've seen already a, a mentioning of it in these different places. It will be horrible, but I will, be, I will deliver them, but they shall be saved out of it. So look at Zechariah 12, verse 3. In that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. So there's going to be a great burden laid on Jerusalem. But then God's going to make Jerusalem a great burdensome stone on everyone. He, Jerusalem, so to speak, will smash everyone. This is not a popular topic to talk about in our world today. Uh, there is a lot of anti-Semitism. Uh, sometimes there's people, it's not politically correct to be anti-Semitic but it is politically correct somehow to be anti-Israel and to say that we stand for the Palestinian people against them. We want them to have an independent state and so forth. Uh, it's not popular in the world today to stand up and say Israel is going to ultimately smash everyone. This is what God says will happen in this day in the tribulation period. So look at uh, the burdensome soul for all people, middle of verse 3. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. So it's not going to be your typical math equation. Typically, math equations will be something like this. A uh, hundred is greater than one. But on this day, it'll be one is greater than a hundred. Whatever the ratio, whatever the numbers are. The small, insignificant Israel, the, the land that they inhabit is about the size of New Jersey. It's a little tiny nation. And they will not only survive the attack, but they will end up cutting to pieces all the armies that come against them because God is going to stand up and be on their side. Look at verse 4. In that day, said the Lord. By the way, that phrase, in that day, it happens over again. It happens about 16 times here in Zechariah 12, 13, and 14. There's a lot that's happening right here. This is not, some will happen here and some will happen several generations later. It says, in that day. Day. It's not exactly a 24-hour day, but it, this is the day of the Lord, this time period, which will be seven years. The day of the Lord is the tribulation period. But in that day, said the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. So God is going to 
attack the armies that come against them. He says the horse and the rider. Will they be on horses? Will they be primitive? Some people, I don't know for sure if, it, if it's literal, but it's sometimes God will do things like this and talk about whatever the armaments are, that he will smorth, smite the horse and rider in the day of battle, whether it be tanks or whether it be infantry, whatever it may be. But those that come against him, God will discomfort their attempts and then he will give great courage to his people. It says that the leaders, the governors of Judah will say, and by the way, this doesn't mean that they're trusting in the people. I believe it means that they're going to be trusting in God here. The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. Look at verse 6. It says, in that day will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood and like a torch of fire in a sheaf. And they shall devour all the people round about, on the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. So there will be, Jerusalem will be taken in the siege we just read, but God will empower them, they will turn, they will devour the enemies round about, and Jerusalem will be inhabited again. They've been fleeing, but at the end of this, they'll be able to come back in. In fact, at the very end of it, they're going to come back in and Jesus is going to reign there from Jerusalem, set up his kingdom. Uh, look at verse 7. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. Now, what's happening here? Why would, why would this happen? Judah is the surrounding area. Jerusalem, obviously, is the capital city right there in the middle. And God says, when I come and deliver them, I'm not going straight to Jerusalem. First, I'm going to deliver and save the surrounding, maybe you could say those that are out in the field fighting and those that are in suburban areas. I'm going to deliver them first so that the inhabitants of Jerusalem and those at the capital don't brag and say, well, it's because of us. God's going to say, well, it wasn't because of you. You weren't even delivered yet, and they were delivered. So God is going to deliver Judah first so that there's not going to be a division among the people and some people lifting themselves up. Would people ever do that that are on the same side? I don't People do that in the same family sometimes, you know. I'm better. Why'd you take this? You, uh, I'm speaking hypothetically. I've, I've never experienced that in our house. But uh, you can imagine. Uh, but God is going to do this in a way that, that brings unity and togetherness. And they're not going to be bragging against each other. So God's going to deliver Judah first. Look at verse 8. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. So what this is pointing to is that those that are feeble, weak, or afraid, cowardly, God is going to greatly encourage them and give them strength and courage. They will be like David. You know, when David, when he was on earth, when he would go out to battle, he wasn't flinching. He wasn't afraid. He had the courage like a lion. And God's going to do that with all of Israel, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They will begin to see deliverance and that will embolden them to be able to go out. It's, it's similar. By the way, hold your finger here and look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. Remember the story of David and Goliath? What were all the people doing, including the king? They all had their tail tucked between their legs, hiding behind the rocks, waiting for a pipsqueak teenager to go out and deliver them from Goliath. And uh, David's like, hey, what's going on? How come you don't go fight him? And uh, they're all like, you, you, you go fight him, you know, and they were afraid. And then all of a sudden David wins. In that moment, he doesn't have a sword, not very good planning. But he's, he's on top of Goliath, and he's like, there's a sword. He takes Goliath's sword and cuts off his head. I don't know how much effort that took, but he's like, you know, he gets Goliath's sword, and he just kind of gets it there, and when he lets it go, it just has enough weight to just... Anyway, once they see Goliath's head cut off, everything changed. They came out from behind the rocks. Look what it says in verse 51, 1 Samuel 17, 51. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine, and took his sword, and drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him, 
and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose from their lying down behind the rocks. They arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sherem, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. So, oh, how the, the feeble were courageous all of a sudden, once they saw that the battle was already won, basically. Now, <laughs> there was only one man that was killed, but now they have the courage to go and chase the rest of the army because of what David did. And sometimes, by the way, you can see this sometimes in your life, that if you can win a battle personally, you never know what that can do to someone else that, that can encourage them. And they can say, I didn't think I could ever overcome this in my life, but he did. And maybe if he can through God's power, maybe I can too. You never know because you're, you're kind of like in a fishbowl in the Christian life. Unbelievers and believers are like are watching. And you can do great things for God's name if you are victorious. You can encourage other people. And that's what's going to happen here. As the battle begins to turn, those that are feeble will all of a sudden be like David. And they'll have great courage and God will deliver them and, and they'll all be able to rise up together. So back in Zechariah, look at chapter uh, 12 and verse 9. It says, And it shall come to pass in that day, that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And so all these nations, they come, they fight, God delivers them. And then not only does God save, again, it's a, it's a double thing. Not only does he defensively save Israel, but he offensively is going to seek to destroy all of those nations that come against Jerusalem. You can read about, we won't turn there, you can read about this in Revelation 19. There's the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. And then after that, it says that he comes down and he's on a white horse and all the saints with him and a sword comes out of his mouth and with it he will smite the nations in this great battle here um, at Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. Um, so this is their greatest deliverance. One of the things, what makes it their greatest deliverance ever? One is that the greatest army of all time has come against them and God puts down that army. So that's a great deliverance, but also the situation that happens after the deliverance makes it the greatest deliverance. Whenever Israel in the past have been delivered. And what are some of the examples of deliverance from God? We could say when they were at the Red Sea with the Egyptian army bearing down on them, they're about to get wiped out. And yet God parts the sea and, and uh, severs between the Israelites and the Egyptians with this cloud of fire and, and a, a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. And he takes off the chariot wheels. He delivered them. But then later, they messed up again. They had more problems. And God delivered them. They mess up again. But when this deliverance comes, if I can put it this way, this will be both the greatest and the last deliverance that Israel ever gets. This will be the last time that they ever need to be delivered from anything and anyone. Because what will happen after this deliverance is that Jesus will set up his kingdom. He will sit on the throne and it will be an everlasting kingdom that will never fade away. It will never come to naught again. There will, be, there will never be another problem that Israel has to face. So this greatest deliverance will both be in scope and in time, it will be a forever deliverance. It will be the first ever, forever deliverance that, that God gives Israel. And here's what it says. Look at Zechariah 14 and verse 9. And then Daniel 7 verse 27. These two verses say two things about this deliverance and the kingdom that is set up following it. One is that it's a universal kingdom over all the earth. And two, it's a forever kingdom as far as time. So look at Zechariah 14 verse 9. It says, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. So Jesus will de defend them, deliver them, set up his kingdom over all of the earth. And that is a literal all of the earth. Every person on the planet will be under, will be submitting to and under the authority of Jesus. 
for the first time ever. Look at Daniel, 20, uh, Daniel 7 and verse 27. When he sets up this kingdom, it says this in a couple different places. I want to mention this verse, Daniel 7, 27. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. So that's us. When Jesus comes back with his saints, we will reign. Israel is not going to reign over all the earth. I can put it that way. Jesus will reign over Israel and over all the earth with us. We will be the ones reigning with him. The kingdom will be given to the saints of the Most High. That'll be including us, as well as other you know, Israelite believers that have believed. But um, So the, the kingdom shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And all dominions shall serve and obey him. So the Bible says two things about this, by the way, when we come and reign with him. It says that we will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. And it also says we will rule and reign with him forever. Because it will be a, a physical kingdom on the earth for the millennium, the thousand years. And then that will go on into all eternity. We'll reign forever. And it's not we're going to reign for a thousand years and then we got to go back into our hole, you know. We will reign forever and ever. So this is Israel's greatest deliverance for many reasons. And then this will be immediately followed by, this is an interesting dynamic, the deliverance will come first and then will be Israel's greatest repentance. So they, they go together and yet there's also a, an element of time. So look at back in Zechariah chapter 12, look at verse 10. So Jesus has been delivering them. He's showing up. He's giving them courage. And then verse 12, or verse 10, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for for his firstborn. So a couple things I want to mention here about this. First thing I want to mention is this is a beautiful place to come. One of my favorite places in the Old Testament to come that shows the deity of Christ, that Jesus is God. It's Amen. very clear. If you go back, we won't read all of it, but if you go back into Zechariah 12, 10, over and over, it says, and I will deliver. And, and who's speaking? It says in that day, the Lord, you know, we can see it. Look, at, for example, at um, verse 8. In that day shall the Lord, capital, it's all caps, capital L-O-R-D. The Hebrew word there is Jehovah. There's, there's other words that are translated Lord, Adonai, and usually that's um, lowercase, or maybe a capital L, but lowercase O-R-D. But whenever you see in the Old Testament, in the King James, capital L-O-R-D, all caps, it's always Jehovah God. You could take Jewish people there today, and they would say, that is God. That's my God. That is our God. He is the Jehovah, the creator, the self-sufficient God. They would all say, this is God. And so this is God saying, I will defend the inhabitants. And then we get to verse 10, it says, and they shall look upon me, still God the Father talking, still God, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And who did, is and they is talking about Israel. Who did Israel pierce? It was Jesus. When he came and he says, I'm the Messiah, I'm come to deliver you. They said, no, crucify him. And they pierced him. And when he comes, it says, they are going to look on me whom they have pierced. And they're going to be this collective. If you, if you listen quietly, you're going to hear this big, oh, you know, the realization that the one that we pierced Jesus is the one that just delivered us. And it says in verse 1 there that we just read, he's the one that stretched out the heavens. He's the one that laid the foundations of the earth and he put the spirit of man in him. This is Jesus. And it's very clear, many, many places throughout the Bible. I hope if you're struggling that is Jesus really God, when Jesus was on the earth, how come he never just said the phrase, I am God? How come he never said that? Well, he did say, I am in John 8, 58, and when he said that, they took up stones to stone him because they knew he was claiming to be God. And so, you know, there are people who claim to believe the Bible. 
Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Muslims. Muslims claim to believe the Bible, by the way. They say the Bible is perfect, it's true. It's just that what you have was corrupted and tampered with by Jews in the Old Testament and by Christians in the New Testament. But they say Jesus never said that. No, it's, it's right here, it was written, Jesus says, I, before Abraham was, I am. And that's the same I am that goes back to Exodus 3 at the burning bush when, when God says, I am that I am, hath sent you. That's Jesus. Jesus was the one at the burning bush that he said, I am to Moses. In, um, look at one, let's look at one passage about this. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, to show that it was Jesus all the way in the Old Testament. When they were, what, who parted the Red Sea? Who led Israel into the wilderness? Who provided for them all those years in the wilderness? It was specifically Jesus. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. And we'll read down through verse 4. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud. This is talking about the generation in the wilderness. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, the Red Sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That baptized means that by going through that, they identified with Moses and his leadership. Um, verse 3, And did all eat the same spiritual meat? And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. When, when Moses smote the rock and water came out and fed them, that was Jesus that provided for them. That was Jesus that was with them every step. It was Christ. Uh, he is you say, well, where have you been all these years? I've been here the whole time, he says. Sometimes he would appear to them as the angel of the Lord and reveal things. Sometimes he was invisible to them. But he was the pillar of cloud. He was the pillar of fire. He led them all the way. It's always been Jesus. And one day when people stand before God, they're going to find out that it's Jesus. And we see this in multiple places. Let me just read this very quickly. Matthew 7, verse 22. Jesus is speaking. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. He's speaking to his disciples and he says this, Many will say to me in that day, this is when the day that they stand before God, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? When people stand before God, they will stand before Jesus. And Jesus is going to have to be the one to say, I'm sorry, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. But unbelievers that scoff and, de and deny him, they can't wish him away. They will one day stand before him. He's the God that's always been, that created everything. He was the one that provided for Israel. He's the one that they will stand before one day. And so we see this in Zechariah 12.10. They will look upon me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn. And so this, this is the moment. Jesus is going to deliver them physically. They're not going to heaven yet. They're not saved yet. But by the time of the end of Zechariah 12, they are saved spiritually. So the word saved means delivered. First, Jesus saves them physically so that the Antichrist and these armies don't kill them. He saves them, but they're not going to heaven. And then he will save them spiritually because they will believe. No one ever gets to go to heaven without believing. That's right. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Nobody ever gets a pass. Uh, just because someone is the ch son of Abraham or the child of Abraham or Israelite, they don't get a pass. They need to believe. The Bible says that he will, we saw this in Zechariah, he will defend all those, he will save all those that are written in the book, those that believe, those that are saved. And so this is their moment of salvation. They shall look upon me. If you, if you say, what's the moment that Israel is saved spiritually? This is the moment. He will appear to them, he will put down the enemies, the armies, and they shall look on me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn. What's the mourning about? I mean, they, they've just been delivered. They, they should say, they shall look on me whom the pierce, and they rejoiced that I just destroyed the Antichrist and so forth. It says they shall mourn over their piercing of him, over their rejection of him. Now, obviously, the generation that will be alive is not the generation that saw Jesus, but they are the children that follow right in their footsteps, and they say, no, he's not the Messiah. We're waiting for the Messiah, but it can't be Jesus. But that at this moment, they will turn and so look at Romans chapter 11. Here is one of the places where it prophesies that the turning of Israel as well. Romans 11, let's read verses 25 through 27.
it says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. This is where they are right now. Right now they're spiritually blind. They don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So one of the things that has to happen is that Jesus is waiting for yet more and more Gentiles to believe, to be saved. And then he will redirect his attention to Israel. But once the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, verse 26, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. So the word saved, I mentioned this, it means delivered. And the context determines what they're saved from. Some people go to this and say, well, this doesn't mean that all Israel is going to be spiritually saved and go to heaven. That's what the word saved here means. How do I know that it means that? Well, it says the context is that all Israel shall be saved because the quotation, which is not a direct quotation, but kind of paraphrased from Isaiah 59, I think verse 20 here, that there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness. So the turning away ungodliness is not physical deliverance, that's spiritual deliverance, that's salvation. And then at the end, and for this is my covenant to them when I shall take away their sins. This saved is a taking away of sin. We also see that the same context in back in Romans chapter uh, 10. Uh, Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And he says, I want them to be saved more than else. He's not just praying, I pray that they'll be delivered from Rome because that's not going to happen. They will be judged by Rome. But he says, I want them to be saved. Because right now they're going about to establish their own righteousness and they're not submitting to the righteousness. He's praying for their spiritual salvation and he says one day it will come. God will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. God will take away their sins and this is the moment. He will deliver them from their greatest judgment. He will give them their greatest deliverance and it will result in their greatest repentance. They will turn to him. They will be saved. And so with this salvation here, there's a great mourning over their sin. Look what it says. Um, hey, well, we're going to come back to, well, to... Let's read Zechariah 12, and then we'll read some other verses about mourning. I thought we'd uh, finish uh, such a joyful sermon with mourning. But uh, look at Zechariah 12, verse 11. And let's read down through 14. It says, In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem, as the mourning of hadad Rimmon in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart, the family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart. All the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. Interesting the word remain there kind of harkens back to the siege of Jerusalem, that many were killed. But everyone that remains, all of them, will look at Jesus and then they will mourn. And the word apart there that several times mentioned, it means that there will be a widespread mourning, but it's not just this congregational mourning. It is going to be an individual mourning, a weeping, a mourning. It says that even husbands and wives are going to get separate. They're going to separate themselves from each other and mourn individually and personally. And this is always what's important, by the way. This is, this is always what we need. There's not like, well, our, our church had a great revival. How, how does a church have revival unless an individual, unless a group of individuals, you can't, you can't just have a revival for your family. Well, I, you know, I, I said, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. I, d I decided, you know, the kids are not really on board, but that's what's happening. You know, there's no salvation to an individual unless they believe the gospel. You can't get saved for somebody else. You can't get saved for your parents or your children or your spouse or your friends, your neighbors. Every, and so that's what's happening here. Every individual is mourning himself and herself over their sin, over their rejection of the Messiah. They will now believe in him and they are so sorry that they have been rejecting him for all of this time. So there's both, a, there's a universal mourning among Israel, but also an individual mourning. 
And let's look at some verses about this. Uh, turn to James chapter 4. While you're turning there, I want to read Matthew 4, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And when he says that, he doesn't just mean that if you have any kind of sorrow and tragedy and you mourn over it, then you're blessed, you're going to be comforted. He, because, you know, an unbeliever could, let, let's say an unbeliever is robbing a bank and he and his buddy are robbing the bank and his buddy gets shot and killed and he, oh, I'm so sorry, my buddy got shot and killed, but he keeps the money. It's Jesus saying, blessed is that person for he should be comforted. No, it's not just any mourning. It's talking about blessed are they that mourn over their sin. I mourn, in, in the previous verse, verse 3 says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To be poor in spirit is to be morally bankrupt. I am nothing before God, and then I mourn over my sin. Jesus says there's a great blessing if you mourn over your sin. Not that you mourn that you got caught, <laughs> but that you mourn that you did it in the first place. You mourn that you displeased God, that you dishonored God. Look at James 4, and starting in verse 8. It says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. That is an awesome statement, by the way. That's the greatest thing we need in life. We need God to come close to us. How do we get it? You draw nigh to him. So how do you do that? <coughs> draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. What we often have in our Christianity, our modern Christianity, as churches and as individuals, is that we're just too flippant with our sin. We can be living in the middle of sin, and yet laughing and joking, everything's fine, when we are under God's judgment. That's not a laughing, joking matter, but we kind of sweep that under the rug, kind of put blinders on, I'm not aware of that, and let's go on, everything's fine. It says, let your laughter be turned to mourning. What we need is to draw nigh. This is true, by the way, for salvation and also for us as believers. We need, if there's, when we sin, there's a break in fellowship. We need to get that right with God. And the only way it happens is if we mourn over our sin, we're contrite, we confess that to God, then there can be joy, forgiveness. Now we can get back to laughter and so forth. Look at Ezra chapter 9. And I'll start reading in verse 3. Here's Ezra's response. They're out of the Babylonian captivity. Yay, we're back home. We're going to be rebuilding the temple. We're going to be rebuilding the wall soon. Everything's great. But then he hears Israel's doing it again. They're intermarrying with the heathen again. That's what sent them into Babylonian captivity in the first place and the idolatry that went along with that. And he hears they're doing it again and it's widespread. It's among all the people. So here, Ezra hears that. Look what he says in verse 3. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished or astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness. And having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, O God. For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass has grown up unto the heavens. Is Ezra acted like this, and he wasn't even the one that did it. <laughs> Imagine, he hears of the sin of the people, and he falls in with them and identifies with them. And I'm not saying that we necessarily, we're not trying to impress people that we necessarily do things on an outward, you know, I'm not saying that you need to rip out your hair and your beard and rip your clothes <laughs> But they, in, this was kind of a cultural thing that they would do to show grief and sorrow and mourning. And he's acting like somebody just died. This is what, how you would act if, you're, if your father died. But he's doing it because he hears about sin. Do you and I mourn the same way over sin as we do a death in the family? You say, well, it depends on who it was that died. You know, just kidding. 
But wow. do we, are we broken over our sin? Or we just, you know, live in a world, what do we say? Oh, you did that sin. Oh, it's, it's okay. The world says it's fine. Everyone's doing it. We need to get in God's word and see what God says about our sin and mourn over our sin. In anything short of that, we do not have God's blessing, his favor, his presence in our lives. I'm not saying that if you're saved, if you're already saved, this is not the way to stay saved or that you lose your salvation. But there's a broken fellowship with God and nothing will fix that. You can't just, well, you know what, God, I just pray. You know, I still pray every day. God, I'll pray that you would bless me. If I'm harboring that sin, I'm not going anywhere with God. I'm stuck. And God wants us to mourn over our sin. That's what happens here in this day when the Israelites, when they see the one that they have pierced, they mourn. And there is a drawn out widespread mourning and they are saved spiritually. So it's safe to say, I think, that this repentance, this greatest repentance that Israel is going to have, would not have come without the great judgment that precedes it. If not, if, if it could come, why don't they just repent today? They're not repenting. And, and I believe that they will not repent as a nation until this happens. So it will be the worst thing ever, the great judgment, but it will turn out to be a blessing. It will turn out to be one of the best things ever because it, as well as the deliverance, will lead to their repentance. Without the judgment and without the deliverance, they probably never would have repented. So what do we think about that judgment? And then we import it today. What do we think about our own trials? You go through something. Maybe you're living in sin and God makes the wheels fall off in your life. You might lose your job. Sometimes people lose their family. They lose their ministry. Some different things. Uh, the wheels come off because of sin. That could be a horrible thing or could be the best thing ever that ever happens to you in your life is a severe judgment from God if it causes you to turn back to him. The best for some people I know that have been in prison, they say the best thing that ever happened to me is that I went to prison. I was there, I heard the gospel, I got saved, now I'm serving God in my life. Might never have happened if I hadn't gone to prison. Now, we're not saying that the best thing ever is to go do a crime to go to prison. <laughs> but if we often think that getting caught and having punishment is the worst thing ever, could be the best thing ever if it causes you to turn to God. Amen. So are you wasting the judgments or what God is trying to do to get your attention in life. Maybe God is chasing you down. Maybe you're here and you, you don't know that you're going to heaven one day. You've never believed the gospel. And maybe you feel like things are hard. You feel like God is after you. I love the testimony of John Bunyan that he says that he was lost and he felt like I was, I was running from God until I turned around and I saw Jesus chasing after me. And now he didn't literally see this, but the way that he... He describes it. I turned around and I saw Jesus chasing me, but I noticed that he had a pardon in his hand. He was chasing me down because he wanted to save me. And so many people are running from God and they reject him, but he is trying to draw us back to him. I want to finish with this verse. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11. Hebrews 12, 11, this passage, this section talks about the chastening of God and how that it, if God is chastening someone that's a believer, it's actually a proof that he's a believer. If someone's not a believer, it says, you know, God would just let you go your own way. And if God is not chasing after you, it says then you more an indication that you're a bastard and not a son, is what it says. So look at Hebrews 12, verse 11. Here's what happens at the end of it. It says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. So when you're in the middle of that trial, you're not, Hey, I got a testimony today. Praise the Lord. You know, I've been living in sin, and God really got me this week. Took away my job. Hallelujah. You know, when you're in the middle of it, it's not awesome. But it says this. It, for the present, it doesn't seem to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. But it only does this if we allow it to. God's chastening, God's judgment can be the best thing ever if we allow it to, if we are exercised by it, if we uh, are brought low so that we will turn to him. So maybe God's doing something in your life. I just want to ask you this question. Are you allowing him to do what he's doing in your life? Are you allowing it to accomplish what he wants to accomplish? Sometimes people 
They, they're away from God. He judges them and they get further from God. Oh, see, I was thinking about coming back, but look, he's judging me. Oh, I don't like God. God's angry. I hate God. And people turn away from God. God's not doing it because he hates you. He's doing it because he wants to draw you back. He says, all day long have I stretched out my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people. His, his arm is stretched out in judgment, but his arm is also stretched out as an offer. Come back home. And if we will allow hitting rock bottom to cause us to look up, nowhere else to look but up, maybe I'll go back to God. That's what God wants. That's what's happening in Zechariah 12. Israel is going to be hitting rock bottom, the worst judgment ever. But then God will reach down and deliver them, the greatest deliverance ever. And then they will repent. It will be the greatest deliverance that Israel's ever had. Whenever they've repented in the past, they end up going back to it. When this happens, they will never go back. They will enter the kingdom and be the subjects of Jesus. Uh, what a wonderful passage, uh, Israel's greatest repentance. Let's close together. Lord, we thank you for this time to see the future. We don't know how long, how far into the future this is, but we thank you that you know exactly how things are going to end in the world. We know that you know the future of Israel and the Gentile nations. You know our future. So Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you as Savior, that they would see what is coming in the world, they would see what is coming upon sin, and that even today would be the day of salvation. I pray that there's someone here that doesn't know that if they die today or in 50 years, that they'll go straight to heaven. I pray that even today they would say, Jesus, be merciful to me, a sinner. I realize I've done wrong, but I realize that you paid the price by dying on the cross. You paid the price for my sin so that I wouldn't have to pay for it. And will you forgive my sin and save me? We, we thank you that it's as simple as that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For those of us that are believers, if there's anyone that's wayward and perceives either your judgment or your deliverance, maybe you and mercy have delivered in a way that we don't deserve from something, I pray that that would lead us back to you. Help us to turn to you where, wherever we are. And we thank you for your forgiveness and restoration. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching today. If you have made a decision to follow God in some way or would like prayer, let us know at flbc at cox.net. We would love to connect with you, pray for you, or send you some resources that can help you in your walk with God. If you would like to know more about how to go to heaven, visit us at folbaptist.com slash heaven. If you would like to give financially to support our ministry, you can do so at folbaptist.com slash give. Thank you and God bless you.